um, you know, Phil and I actually go way back to our uh, occipital days. So it's always uh, fun being around this scoundrel, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. the first time anyone's ever said it's fun to be around me. So thank you. Well, I mean, from a distance, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to OpenCV Weekly Webinar. And today we have with us Jacob Irwin, who is the CEO of Active Replica. And we are going to talk about building social ecosystems through virtual uh, worlds. So welcome, Jacob. Uh, we'll go through you know, a, a detailed introduction ju in just a bit. But first, uh, let me also introduce you to Phil. I mean, he needs no introduction because uh, he's been hosting the webinars for a very long time. And Phil is the director of content at OpenCV. And uh, welcome, Phil. Yeah, good morning, Satya. Welcome back, everybody. You got a warm welcome from the chat. Um, we're glad to have you back. Everybody who's joining us again, I'm going to remind you of a few things that we do every week here on OpenCV Weekly Webinar, one of which is a special giveaway to you in the audience. Jacob has been so kind as to offer up either a one month subscription to Active Replica or an Active Replica t-shirt. So stay tuned for that later. We'll also be taking Q&A from you in the audience. So use the little Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or ask your question in the comments wherever you're watching, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitch, Twitter, et cetera. And we'll do our best to answer your questions during the flow of the show. We'll also save some time at the end to get to the ones that we don't get to normally. Um, yeah, that's it, Satya. All right. So. Jacob, it's your show. I mean, tell us uh, a little bit about your background, and then we will go over the slides and uh, go over the, you know, what we'll, we'll hear from you about virtual worlds and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me uh, here, Phil and Sate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Phil and I actually go way back to our uh, occipital days, so it's always uh, fun being around this scoundrel, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's um, yeah. the first time anyone's ever said it's fun to be around me. So thank you. Well, I mean, from a distance, you know. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's good. Um, yeah. So let's see my background. Um, I've been uh, working in augmented and virtual reality since about 2009. Um, again, back in the days when you actually had to like jailbreak the iPhone in order to get access to the camera to do basic, uh, basic, you know, even the basic things. And worked at uh, Matayo as a software engineer doing augmented reality back in the early teens, um, worked on some uh, HoloLens style prototypes along with uh, Matt Meisnick's for a little Samsung subdivision, and ended up at Occipital with Phil building the bridge headset, which was an open source um, computer vision driven mobile phone powered uh, um, augmented and mixed reality uh, headset with its own um, little ecosystem of app developers and the uh, uh, um, community there, which was really exciting. Then in uh, 2019, I moved up here to Vancouver. And uh, in 2020, something unusual happened, um, which <laughs> I think we all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's really sad. <laughs> I don't know, but suddenly everybody was stuck indoors a lot more than they had been previously. Um, I, I, I met my, uh, my co-founder up here, um, pre-pandemic action we were we were kind of hanging out socially another uh, virtual reality enthusiast somebody who had a background in location-based virtual reality so what does it mean when you drop 10 people into the same room and have them all you know sharing virtual experiences and so when the pandemic hit we were like hmm okay maybe there's a maybe there's some sort of opportunity here for kind of emerging technology to help uh mitigate this uh, feeling of everybody being home alone by themselves doesn't feel good and we just started kind of doing a lot of user research then so we were like ah maybe realty right you know we looked into 3d scanners people selling houses you can do visits it didn't really seem like the thing uh then we had this great idea of oh hey all the museums are closed why don't we do photogrammetry of all the museums put the museums on you know, some sort of web-based uh, social platform and then people can do tours through the museums and have um, you know, kind of social experiences that way. That's where the name uh, Active Replica came from actually. And uh, yeah, the, we, we, we built a little prototype and we pitched it to the museums and they were like, God, we're hemorrhaging money, please make it stop. No, we're not gonna spend a dollar on anything. No, 
Um, and so, no, no, we got we got rejected from all of the museums, but we did end up with this really interesting um, prototype, which was a virtual uh, museum hosted through Mozilla Hubs, which is a web-based uh, kind of social VR type platform. And uh, we had a bunch of guests over to kind of tour the museum at one point, and we invited about uh, 10 feet people to, talk, to pop by one time um, to kind of like tour this little web-based museum. And two and a half hours later, we had about 25 people in the room. We had to sign off. We had to kick people out of the party, basically. And we're like, okay, all right, maybe there's something here, you know? And uh, that's how we got our first gig, actually. Somebody who had been invited by somebody who had been invited was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Um, you know, we, we have an in-person event that got canceled for 150 teams. Can you build us a virtual world and help us um, connect our community through this virtual space? And so that's how we got our start into kind of the virtual world ecosystem. That's so, great. Quick little, quick little uh, opening sequence, anyways. Yes, yeah, so, uh, and for full disclosure purposes, I also worked uh, a little bit with Active Replica before I joined OpenCV. Yeah, a man of many hats. <laughs> All right, uh, so um, let's let's get started uh, on the presentation. Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, so with that kind of a background, I'll give, um, and how I think uh, I would be interested in, in this going today is I have just a, a few slides about uh, who Active Replica is and what we're doing within kind of the like merging web. Um, I'm going to call it the metaverse. We can complain about that a little bit later in the, a little bit later in the podcast. But I'll talk a little bit about who we are and uh, what it is we're doing within this, this uh, ecosystem of organizations. Then I'd actually kind of like to pull back a little bit and look at the broader um, series of organizations. There's a lot of really interesting companies out there right now building um, protocols to kind of power the open web, um, specifically like the open immersive web. And I'd like to talk about just like what uh, what does why why do I believe the web is going to be the place where the like actual metaverse kind of emerges out of? So um, yeah, uh, let's see. Um, can everyone uh, see my screen here? Yes. Yeah, looks good. All right, cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm just going to do a, uh, have a quick little chat here about building uh, social ecosystems using virtual worlds and like uh, what that means, right? Uh, I already gave my kind of a little spiel, you know, background as a software engineer, moved into uh, product management, and now um, co-founded uh, Active Replica with my uh, co-founder, Valeria Dennis. And, uh, you know, we've got a really great team, about half of them based here in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, but we're, uh, we're fully remote um, for, like, <laughs> even though we're all located in the city, we're uh, remote first. And uh, we have, uh, we have uh, people uh, all around the world uh, helping us out on this. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so we're in the middle of a really exciting evolution, I think. So just to kind of jump right into it, which is that, in the early days of the pandemic and everybody being stuck at home, there was a, a lot, a, kind of this like explosion of, uh, of virtual worlds, right? And there's a lot of value that came out of that, right? Helping people connect in a way that they weren't able to connect um, through Zoom, right? You know, like Zoom is great for these kind of things. Like, hey, there's three of us. When I stop talking, one of you guys can stop talking and that all works really well. Uh, where video conferencing fails, and this is where you know platforms like GatherTown or Kumo Space have really stepped in, is um, ho hosting social events is uh, more difficult, you know, through the uh, through the traditional platforms. Um, and so we saw this kind of like plethora of virtual world providers uh, coming out and offering a lot of free virtual spaces. Um, but that's just not enough, right? Like at the end of the day, having access to a three D virtual world. Um, if, if you drop into a 3D virtual world, you like look around like, okay, cool, that's neat, and you leave. I'm um, just to actually, maybe before, before I jump into this, I'm um, just to give people a 10 second demo of what I'm talking about. So for example, this is our, um, our activereplica.io, it's a website, right? So you can drop to it. Um, and then it's uh, basically like a little browser-based uh, virtual world here that you, know, you can explore kind of using you know, WASID and your, uh, your arrow keys. Uh, but it's also uh, social and it has spatial audio, right? So anybody else who hits the same URL will uh, will drop in as well. Um, you can have up to about 30 people in a room and uh, uh, daisy chain multiple rooms together, portal between different rooms, um, all of those uh, all of those different things. Oh, hey, got a uh, Phil right there. There you go. That's so, me. You know. Hey, everybody. Hey, Phil. So when, when you say spatial audio, it actually 
let's say a person is very far away, uh, right. they are going to be muted compared to somebody who is very close by, right? And also directional. Exactly. Yeah. So if we had 30 people in the room and I was standing here having a conversation with Phil, yeah. uh, I might be able to overhear a conversation um, further on down the down the thing. And if I got bored of my conversation with Phil, I could politely excuse myself and move over to the, the table where the, the other conversation was happening. You know, which has also never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Terrible, terrible example. Um, yeah, Actually, and uh, but... uh, the, there's another uh, very important reason why spatial audio is useful in these virtual worlds is that let's say all, all the audio is coming, um, you know, uh, if, if you don't have spatial audio, you cannot actually decipher. It looks, it sounds like noise. Uh, it's when it's more mm -hmm. people are talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, as soon as you have spatial audio, it becomes, I mean, it's still a little bit noisy, but at least you're able to decipher, you're able to focus on one person, even if they may be far away, if you want to focus on some person, uh, you can focus on that particular person and uh, tune out other people. Uh, yeah. This is, I mean, I saw a demo at a large company. I don't know whether I signed an NDA, <laughs> but I cannot <laughs> reveal much, but um I, I, I saw some uh, demo of the spatial uh, audio and it was just uh, eye opening or maybe it was mm -hmm. ear opening. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're first, absolutely first right. And the other maybe. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I, and I see that actually one of our, uh, it seems like probably one of the guests from the, the webinars dropped in and is also exploring right now. And that's one of the things that is really exciting to me about um, web based virtual worlds is the accessible nature of it. Right. There's no app to download. There's nothing to install. Um, there's no accounts to create uh, unless you want to limit access to your room. And so with a single click, um, people are able to, to drop in and start exploring and start having conversations um, with each other through these, uh, through these virtual worlds as well. Um, Actually, uh, CVPR, uh, which is one of our top conferences is going on uh, right now. And um, one of the, uh, it has grown big. Now it is, you know, just 10 years back, it used to be about a 10th of the size it is right now. And one of the, uh, one of the complaints people have these days is that to, to see a single poster, <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they cannot get to the poster. There is such a big crowd, especially yeah. if the poster is popular, they cannot even go and talk to the author because it's so mm -hmm. crowded. Mm -hmm. And this kind of virtual experience can, can really help in those scenarios, right? You you still get a sense of, oh, you're going to this conference, et cetera, but maybe you can control, delete some of the people <laughs> from the <laughs> crowd and, you know, um, have a better experience than in real life where you, you're you literally elbowing people out. Um, yeah, absolutely. And again, even, um, I mean, you can talk about the, uh, the accessible nature for it for people who are either unable or um, have difficulty traveling, um, but then you still get a much more personal type of um, reaction than, um, than through Zoom. Again, like when you're having, um, I think what I've found is that uh, you have a lot more organic conversations um, when you're hosting a live event like this, as opposed to in Zoom being moved into a breakout room or something like that. Uh, the other well, thing that we've, there's, we there's find... also good stuff like the serendipity of just you mm -hmm. catch something out of the corner of your eye and now there's something else to you know kind of talk about for a second while you think mm -hmm. about what you were just talking about like those sorts mm -hmm. of little bits of uh serendipity uh really add like they're irreplaceable i feel yeah, that that's very true and the other thing that we've found is also a sense of uh, identity right like whether it's one of these uh, conferences or one of the organizations that we work with um uh, when you're in video conferencing, you don't have a sense of location and mood and ambiance and like, who am I with and why am I here, right? Or is that something that uh, that uh, space making is actually a real art, obviously dating back tens of thousands of years. And so we work with um, architects on our team, you know, to, to say like, how, what are we communicating through the choices of the spaces that we're making? And how do we, how do we engage people through the, through these virtual spaces? Um, and help build up uh, again a sense of identity for a for a particular organization. I can see that we have more uh, uh, more more folk wandering around here. Um, Y'all are welcome. Yeah, feel but free. That, it's uh, that that URL is activereplica.io. Once again, if uh, folks in the audience want to go poke around, it's it's relatively safe. I think you'll be okay. <laughs> we we usually don't fight. 
But that said, um, again, like uh, uh, just having a virtual world isn't enough. What we'll find here, if we, I think if we left this open is um, people will wander around for about five minutes and then they'll leave, right? Uh, especially people who don't, who don't know each other. Um, what really engages people is having a virtual event, right? And so having having a you know a run of show, having things happening, having people um, presenting, having things to do, treasure hunts, whatever. Uh, but it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work to, uh, to 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 program these events, and it's a lot of work to actually get people to show up. Um, and when you have nothing to do, you end up with a with a ghost town, right? And so you know, looking at basically all of the kind of uh, keystone virtual world providers out there. I don't want to say that, you know, like obviously VR chats into ghost world and um, alt space VR is doing some really great work. And there's, there's, you know, a lot of thriving communities out there, but given the hundreds of different virtual world providers out there, what we're finding is that um, ones that are driven purely by the, the visuals of their virtual worlds have, have very low uh, engagement and very low, uh, low retention. And so, one of the things that uh, that we're looking at do at doing and uh, are currently in the process of doing is taking all of the so these are this is kind of a a, a selection of some of our uh, our customers here uh, currently is we're working on uh, the process right now of taking these kind of like siloed different organizations each of which are hosting their own events um, are using their own persistent virtual worlds to engage with their communities um, we work with a lot of social uh, institutions we work with a lot of educational institutions um, and we're starting to to actually link them up. So each of these different organizations right now for us has, you know, their own dedicated URL, they have their own virtual world, they have their own virtual events through it. And what we're going to begin doing is um, opening portals, or, or we've, we've begun doing, and we're going to start talking about it more publicly, is opening portals between these different organizations and letting them share uh, resources, letting them broadcast their events to um, partner nodes, um, letting them... Um, also, we're going to be doing things like um, job fairs and scholarship fairs to actually give value to the, uh, the members of these uh, of these different uh, organizations. That's really interesting to me uh, as an old guy because it reminds me very much of MUDs and MUXs. I don't know how many people out there uh, played like Telnet text-based adventure community games back in the day, but... Um, this sort of bi-directional communication, uh, this, this mm -hmm. layout specifically, this is basically what a, a map of a MUD, a multi-user dungeon mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. from 1987 or 1990 would look like. Mm -hmm. And that's really mm -hmm. interesting to me because it's, uh, it's, it's kind of foundationally building on something that existed before that there's a bunch of, we learned a bunch of stuff already, <laughs> right? Like you don't, you don't need to completely reinvent the wheel for this stuff. You can look, to, to the past to help, you know, create the future. Uh, exactly. And I mean, the way that I see uh, all technology is like an evolution and an iteration, right? Like, I don't think that this is the uh, the end of the line. We're going to build this and we're going to say, cool, we're done, right? It's always going to be um, this, this, this evolving um, process where, you know, the past is brought into the present and what did we learn from that? And what are we uncovering now um, now for the first time? Uh, and one of the things that's really exciting to me about building on top of Mozilla Hubs is that it's a, it's an open source um, platform built by Mozilla. So we have our own fork of it, for example. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a web-based virtual world platform. And there's um, dozens of other organizations building their um, companies and um, powering different um, organizations through Mozilla Hubs. And there's also a lot of other third-party kind of like open metaverse folk um, as well. Meta, uh, oh, okay. Actually, uh, apparently this is the metaverse verse, but, um, <laughs> um, but yeah. And so, you know, the first step kind of being the, like, meta, the metaverse, I mean, metaverse, it's yeah, a, it's, 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 that's actually a trademark. Please do not infringe on our metaverse it, it, trademark. Web, web, web 3.1. <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know, so, so right now what we're doing is we're linking together a bunch of, uh, organizations within kind of the active replica network. But then there's also this um, plethora of other folk building on top of um, Hubs Cloud as well. And there are other, you know, um, web-based, um, accessible, URL-driven um, protocols and uh, platforms out there as well. And I think in the zeitgeist, there's a lot of uh, different companies right now talking about web-based protocols to, uh, to enable communication between these different uh, virtual world providers, which we're really excited to um, 
be kind of having a, having a conversation with some of these folk. And it's still the early days right now, but I do think that there's a world in which um, we get a metaverse that looks much more like the web than I think some of the like siloed um, app-based platforms that are currently uh, currently out there on the market. Uh, one, one, one group that just uh, um, we, we crossed paths with a few times recently is the, uh, the Croquet folk. Um, so Croquet is building a, a Java-based, JavaScript-based system. And one of the really neat features is the ability to basically have kind of like iframe style portals, right? Where you can just paste a link um, it creates a portal into uh, into your space. So the uh, Alice, for example, is on a different URL um, on a different provider and being able to move seamlessly without a page reload or anything like that in between different um, instances run by different companies, um, but with the you, the uh, experience for the user being completely frictionless, right? Uh, and while this is obviously still in the uh, in the early days right now, we're seeing a, a number of organizations um, similar to Croquet, like um, Immerse Space, for example, um, doing some really great work in terms of um, building the protocols that we think are going to power this kind of like open metaverse of the, uh, you know, uh, as we kind of enter the mid 2020s. Do these, uh, I'm guessing that these platforms, um, you know, Mozilla Hub, the coding uh, is done using JavaScript or what is the, how do you build mm -hmm. these? Yeah, so so a number of folk are using um, JavaScript. Hubs is um, primarily based on A-Frame and uh, React, uh, okay. with you know like a retic reticulum sublayer, and uh, currently mostly it's easiest to set up your own Hubs cloud instance on um, AWS. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a there are folk out there like um, Will from Standard Magic, I believe, who are working on. Um, moving on, on, on other opportunities as well um, in terms of um, having more control over the hubs cloud and stack specifically. Um, but yeah, no, uh, so I'd say like uh, A-Frame uh, is one of the primary tools that's driving this. Um, uh, Frame VR, for example, is another one of the major players in the ecosystem right now. And they are, I believe, built on Babylon uh, JS, um, so uh, a J JavaScript library, I believe. Um, yeah, so there's some really great work being done here. Yes, and, uh, JavaScript there, all the way down. <laughs> is there any uh, work being done uh, to make, you know, computer vision based? Uh, right now, it looks like uh, you have you can have the avatar. The voice uh, is obviously transmitted, and you can talk and things like that. But uh, can you actually control the avatar using mm -hmm, mm -hmm. your own body and gesture and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's two. There are two specific projects that are coming up uh, to mind. Let me see if I can remember the name of them. Um, hold on one second. Valencia James. Um, uh, so one of them is uh, this Valencia James is a uh, is a um, researcher and artist. I'm um, currently and a dancer. I'm currently at. Uh, Berkeley, I believe. Let me see if I can find their work. Um, they do, uh, they've been doing, ah, here we go, the volumetric uh, performance toolkit. This is what I'm looking for. One second. Excuse me as I frantically Google in front of, uh, front of you all. <laughs> um, but this, uh, this volumetric performance toolkit was built by uh, Valencia James and her, uh, her co-founder. And uh, what they're doing is they're taking, um, I believe it might be a um, Azure Connect, and they're punching it into hubs, right? So they're doing live volumetric capture and live volumetric streaming into these web-based um, web-based uh, systems. Um, and so this isn't necessarily avatar rigging, right? But this is taking um, off-the-shelf depth sensors and um, and projecting it for for the purposes of uh, entertainment and uh, performance art, essentially. So that's that's that's. Uh, I was actually hoping to get um, uh, one of their team on this uh, on this call as a co-host, but wasn't wasn't able to quite swing it. Um, and then there are also people who are doing um, full body rigging using um, traditional two D cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, so rigging a full body avatar from from a camera. Uh, we also have, and this isn't a, uh, unfortunately on the computer vision side of things, but. Uh, a number of organ of, of folk are also doing full body mocap into uh, into Mozilla Hubs as well. 
So this is um, Unwired Dance Theater. Um, they're doing uh, a bunch of live performances where again, they'll start off with actually a 2D screen. Um, they have a full body mocap suit and then they'll step into the virtual world as this avatar and engage with people um, who have again come to, uh, come to one of the performances. Um, ho often hosted by um, Onboard XR, which is kind of an anthology of um, virtual performers experimenting with this uh, web-based uh, platform. And I'm pretty certain that the companies that are, are are looking at creating avatars that look like you, based on uh, you know videos or pictures of you, right? Yeah. So we actually have uh, that's a really good point. Um, we actually have a partnership here with uh, Ready Player Me. And so Ready Player Me is one of the more popular um, uh, avatar creators out there where exactly like you're saying, it, um, it takes a photo of you. Mm -hmm. um, it takes about uh, 10 seconds or so, and then it generates a human looking avatar mm -hmm. um, right away, just uh, with a single click. And it's, um, you know, it's not, a, it's not perfect, but in terms of um, making human uh, uh, style avatars much more accessible, uh, it, 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 again, Re they're really doing a lot to remove the friction from uh, avatar creation, which is obviously like human representation in virtual world is obviously one of the key uh, uh, um, technological challenges that is yeah. that, that it's not something that you can just like brute force, you know? So. Right. So uh, what's the name of uh, this uh, tool again? Yeah, so this is called um, readyplayer.me. Um, they have a, a number of development partners where actually we have them uh, integrated directly into our platform as well so that um, I don't have a demo of that right now, but um, in, uh, in July, you'll be able to click more, click create name and avatar and the pop up that you just saw over here will actually show up within the, uh, within the virtual world so you don't need to go to another, uh, to another page. Right now, um, if I wanted to actually set this as my avatar, I um, would bring up this little pop up. We'll give it a minute here. Copy the link and then change my name and avatar. Oh, I didn't even have my face on. It's embarrassing. Let's see. There you go. And so now if I put a uh, like a camera into the scene, you can see that uh, now I have the uh, the Ready Player Me avatar um, that I just uh, created. And so again, that whole process of um, creating an avatar um and uh, uh getting it set up here took less than a minute you know mm -hmm. it's a far cry from uh i'm sure you remember days at occipital where some of our clients there were building apps to do you know really high definition 3d capture of, of people's uh, heads and bodies and mm -hmm. you know they got pretty great results eventually but you needed you know a pretty fancy ipad you needed the extra hardware with structure mm -hmm. sensor mm -hmm. and you would still, I am, you know, I don't think people actually want to look like themselves. <laughs> like, mm -hmm, I think that's mm -hmm. what we, we found out is that they want to look like a slight, they want it, they want to be themselves, but that doesn't necessarily mean they look exactly like they look in like real life. And I mm -hmm. think that is an important part of this as well. Well, and one of the things that we're learning about doing a lot of work in these virtual worlds and um, especially with the like human, human looking avatars is that, um, you know, I think the uh, there's so many facial expressions. There's so many ways that we cock our head or raise our eyebrow that are really um, run close to the metal in terms of our, our systems looking for cues and information from other human beings, right? And uh, it, I mean, it's obviously I know I'm just kind of describing the uncanny valley, but when there's something that looks quite human but it's giving off the wrong signals it's very confusing right yeah so even for example using uh using ready player me um there are subtle things like the uh the eyes of the avatar move around right yeah but it does the if, little just the idle kind of you know like like a person's do because your eyes never really sit still it's creepy if you if you've ever met someone whose eyes don't move it's terrifying <laughs> Exactly. Um, no, and and uh, and so this like this like these like subtle little human elements that they're adding are really uh, help you feel much more engaged with the person across from you. But at the same time, things like eye movement actually have a big impact, right? If somebody's telling you a very personal story, and you look away for a couple of seconds, like that, that's communicating something, right? And so there's this um, uh, there's noise being added into the system 
that is um, making relating to each other more difficult. And it's the same thing with with video conferencing, right? You know, we're I think we're so hardwired for things like if I say something and the other person pauses before they speak, that means something, right? Even though that pause was just that wire <laughs> going between Vancouver right. and San Francisco was a little bit cluttered at that moment. But like my system is picking up cues based off of um, eye movements, pauses, delays, things like that. And it's um, it's uh, it's definitely not a solved problem yet. And that's, yeah. of course, there's also, you know, there's a spectrum of uh, understanding of those things too. You know, some people do not do well with eye contact or reading faces mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or getting so those subtle cues as well. And so I think that's, you know, an important aspect of this, all these avatars and then creations and stuff as well, is that like, you can, you can talk to those people still, um, I think. But go ahead, Jacob. Uh, actually, so that reminds me, so speaking, so coming back to the kind of like protocol driven collaboration and how um, there's a lot of really interesting companies building on top of, uh, you know, WebXR and specifically uh, Mozilla Hubs. Um, I want to highlight um, uh, Virgil's over here because it's exactly that. They're um, specifically using um, hubs and virtual worlds to help connect um, therapists with um, autistic teen boys, right? Who often have difficulty sitting one-on-one -on -one facing a therapist and having a conversation, right? But by kind of like meeting, uh, me meeting youth who have difficulty socializing where they feel comfortable um they're really finding um a, a lot of value both for the for the teens for the parents because it gives them kind of like a channel in which to start um communicating and having these conversations um i, I don't know just like uh that's really great you you, you using hubs to help um engage uh teens who have difficulty socializing and by meeting them where they're at i think it's, it's really exciting and just one example of the dozens of different companies that are being built on uh, on hubs right now. Yeah, um, so but just again, so, so 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 again, because you're exactly right. Like um, some people aren't super comfortable socializing one on one, sitting facing somebody else, and like, what are the tools that we have kind of in our tool belt to help support them? Um, speaking of tools, there's I've got one or two other little things over here. Um, you know, we're building a couple of interesting systems for um, with, within our own network about um, like safety and security and broadcasting and how do you know where, we're, where you're going, um, providing context and information about basically the destination on the other end of um, some of these portals, right? Uh, how many people are there? Is the room locked? Is there something happening? What am I allowed to do? What are my permissions? Things like that. Um, we're building a simple protocol system for... Um, hubs, cloud to hubs, cloud transference of like names and avatars. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, this will most likely be uh, overwritten by something like uh, Immerse Space. I think that's misspelled. Um, I'll find it later. Um, but there, there are other folk making um, broader protocols, but you know, we're, in the meantime, we're prototyping some of our own um, internal ways to help um, bring these communities um, together. And then I also want to talk just a little bit about um, the type of organizations that we've found um, really interesting to work with. So one of the things about going back to the ghost town conversation, one of the things about building persistent virtual worlds is we've found that there are particular types of organizations that find a lot of benefit from having a virtual space and a virtual identity and a virtual gathering point. Uh, and a lot of these are cultural and community organizations, right? So, for example, we work with uh, Ethos Lab, which is uh, which is a black focused uh, youth organization here in Vancouver, Canada. They just launched their uh, physical uh, location quite recently, where they're um, helping teach um, black youth um, STEAM and uh, getting them their own metaverse platform that they can um, repaint, strip the walls, own, is really helping turn. Um, uh, these teams from kind of like consumers into creators, which I think is something that's really exciting. And so they make really regular use of this, uh, this virtual world because they feel like they have a sense of agency over it. And it's something that isn't a, um, yeah, a ghost town or a dusty closet or anything like that. It's something that like is actually quite, quite useful. And we see a really exciting opportunity to connect with um, a number of kind of like cultural institutions and organizations as well. So, for example, uh, we worked with the uh, uh, Federation of uh, Francophone Canadians um, to help build a museum um, to showcase the different uh, 
regions of Canada and their uh, French history. And so moving into the fall, we're going to be able to take some of these um, uh, community organizations, which have groups of youth, groups of teens, groups of, you know, uh, particular um, particular uh, demographics, and take them on tours through some of these different um, culture and cultural institutions, which we're also helping um, build virtual worlds for. And so I think, again, kind of looking at the ecosystem of opportunities, if you only have your own virtual world as an organization, that gets stale pretty quickly. But as soon as you start kind of uh, increasing that network and increasing that web, uh, you have more opportunities to engage with the members of your organization. Um, yeah, be, simply by being part of the network. And so it's like a symbiotic relationship. This uh, this museum is going to be able to get visitors and the uh, community organization is going to have new and exciting things to do and new places to go. And so at the end of the day, both organizations benefit from uh, from having this uh, communication between them. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, so this, this is just kind of like the, the little little end piece, um, which is again, like one of the things that we're really excited for is this kind of like organically traversable uh, ecosystem, right? So if you spawn into one node, being able to jump over to another node and then um, find your way, basically like what are the neighbor organizations of this, right? Like, um, you know, this is a, for example, uh, I, I don't want to talk about any of the organizations that we haven't signed yet, but we're talking with a number of other kind of like cultural institutions and being able to hit a museum and then jump over to, you know, hey, this is their partner museum in a different province or in a different state. And then from there, find maybe local organizations that are connected with that. I think is really, uh, really exciting. It's almost like uh, going through links, um, you know, from one page to another. And then, uh, exactly. And and this is one of the things that like doesn't really exist right now in the like quote unquote metaverse. I mean, it does within little little clusters, right? But like if I go to uh, VR chat, for example, I pull up a 2D UI of all of the different events that are happening and then I drop into one of those worlds. And then I go back and I pull up the list of, a, of other worlds that are available and I kind of jump into another world. And so it's like a, a long hallway with a bunch of rooms in it, right? And we don't really have, there isn't something right now where it's more uh, organic and bottoms up in terms of, uh, uh, like you said, like almost like the early days of the internet when like uh, there weren't the major search engines and you had to go, you had to kind of find your way around. Yeah, you know, go, to, go, to, go, to the Yahoo, go to the Yahoo homepage. How else would you know what is on the internet? <laughs> exactly. I mean, my, I still have AOL chat as my primary mode of communication. So um, I, ICQ over here, ICQ. But then one, one other thing that we're uh, really excited to do uh, that we're going to be running this uh, fall, uh, end of August, early September, is then taking this um, kind of cluster of organizations that are all working with us and hosting a uh, like a job and education fair, right? So once we have um, several hundred regular active members, again, a lot of these are um, teams who are interested in uh, emerging technology. And here in British Columbia right now, we actually have a huge um, need for more uh, highly skilled um, tech workers, specifically within the emerging technology field. And so we believe that by bringing together um, educational institutions, uh, industry folk who can offer jobs and internships, and these, uh, these kind of like uh, emerging technology focused youth groups, we're gonna be able to build a really exciting um, series of opportunities for kind of uh, everybody involved. That's also something that we'll be talking about more pretty soon. Um, I think that's the end of my slides. I'm, I'm happy to keep uh, keep clicking around and uh, talking yeah. about some more uh, some more interesting folk mm -hmm. in the space, but also happy to just kind of chat and review too. So uh, one question I have is people who are new to these, uh, you know, suppose I have uh, no uh, experience in these virtual worlds, et cetera. So what are the things that, where can one get started, right? Where, what is the first step? Uh, what are the, you know, technologies they need to know about, and even programming, <clears throat> even programming languages, is JavaScript uh, all that one needs to know? Or what are the other things that people need to know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, programming um, JavaScript is, uh, is really helpful. Also, you know, I mean, all the backbone of a lot of these virtual worlds is also 3D modeling, right? And you know, um, GLBs and GLTF are kind of the the de facto um, model format right now that a lot of folk are working with. 
Um, and it's really one of the exciting things for me too, is that a lot of the kind of like open web metaverse ecosystem is actually driven by Blender, which is another open source uh, modeling program as well. And so, you know, I think what we've seen right now from a lot of these uh, web-based platforms is that Blender is the kind of de facto um, tool that everybody is using and that it's kind of running laps around a lot of the more uh, expensive proprietary kind of like film based um, systems that I think even five years ago people were predominantly using. Uh, but yeah, um, you can get started with uh, Mozilla Hubs um, just by going to hubs.mozilla.com and creating your own virtual world there. Um, setting up your own hubs instance is a little bit more complicated, but there's uh, a frame is a technology that I would really highly recommend. Um, Babylon JS, uh, they're doing some really fantastic work over there. And uh, th those are both really great places to get uh, get started. So uh, if if I go to these, uh, your web page, for example, using uh, Oculus Quest 2, will mm -hmm. it give me that uh, virtual experience? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so um, this, and that's, again, one of the exciting things for me about kind of the like open web metaverse is when you're in headset, um, you're going to be able to navigate away <laughs> from, from the page that you're on to another okay. page without even necessarily needing to know the information about the other page that you're going to, right? Because right now, like if you're within VR chat, you can go to any VR chat rooms, but you're not able to leave the VR chat ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in a web-based uh, VR specific uh, context, you're going to be able to put on your headset and you can do this right now, go to activereplica.io, wander around and then portal out to the Virgil's um, mm -hmm. group, for example, and then eventually who knows where you might end up. And the sense of like ex exploration and discovery is something that I think isn't, um, I haven't encountered uh, very much right now in the, in the current kind of, uh, again, metaverse as it exists. Right. Yeah, it's a really, um, I think it's a really interesting time for this. It, it's a, it's been a, a trial by fire for these virtual event companies and, mm -hmm. and projects. And as always happens, some of them get burned and, you know, some of them emerge more powerful. And I think Mozilla Hubs has done a great job of uh, you know, they sort of started a little bit before everything really kicked off and with regards to the pandemic. And they've done a really good job of prioritizing, I think, what to work on in order to get the most benefit to people during this time. And it's, it's really cool. And it's open mm -hmm. source. Uh, you know, like we most of the most of the things we talked about today are open source, which is awesome. Uh, you know, Blender, Python, open source, another another victory for Python open source projects. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. But 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 going rolling back just a minute again, kind of talking about um, virtual event companies and kind of three D world providers and stuff like that. I think there was a, a bit of a gold rush in you know twenty twenty and, and early twenty twenty one when it was like hard lockdowns. Everybody was stuck in front of their computers. We were all on Zoom twenty four seven, and, and everybody was looking for any sort of hint of novelty. And it was just very easy to go out and say, "Hey, give me." 20 grand, 50 grand for a virtual world, Oop, cool, everybody's happy. Now in a um, kind of, I'm gonna call it post COVID context, right? Where um, it's summer outside, right? Like I don't wanna be in front of my computer at the best of times <laughs> and, um, and like COVID's over, we're not in lockdown. Uh, I think there's a, uh, like the, 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 the high tide is going out. And what we're finding now is that the organizations who are simply built on, hey, we're going to give you a 3D model and let you look around it, um, are seeing much lower retention than the types of organizations that are actually providing uh, real value to the members, right? So, for example, one of the one of the reasons why we're working uh, on this kind of uh, mesh of organizations the way that we are is we sat down and we spoke with a lot of our customers, right? And uh, specifically, so taking the taking Ethos Labs, for example, I sat down with the director of Ethos Labs and said, like, virtual worlds aside, what really matters to you? And she said, I really want to get the teams into uh, post-secondary education. and I want to get them internships in the industry, right? Like, I want to take these kids who are interested in science and technology, and I want to help them get to whatever that next stage is, right? And then it was really interesting because then we spoke with some of our educational partners and they said, we really see virtual worlds as a really great way to engage with um, teams who are like plugged in and get it and are like already thinking about this and getting them into our uh, educational programs for emerging technology. 
we're like, oh, okay, so this is interesting. And then again, talking with our emerging technology industry partners, and they're saying, hey, we see this as a really great opportunity for recruiting. We have a huge um, talent crunch right now. And we're like, oh, okay, so all of the different um, legs of the tripod, actually the most beneficial thing that we could even offer is their connection with each other. Um, and so that's that's one of the reasons why we've been really exploring these kind of like holistic ecosystems where we're able to create relationships between these different um, types of organizations. Awesome. Let's, uh, I'm going to take a pause here. We'll do our do our giveaway. So everybody out there in the Zoom audience, we will be doing a giveaway of either uh, your choice, either a T-shirt, an Active Replica T-shirt, or a one-month subscription to Active Replica services. The way this works is I'm going to ask a question based on Jacob's presentation, and you in the Zoom audience are going to try to answer that question. The first person that answers that question correctly will win what I just described. If you have won one of our giveaways in the last two months, please do not answer and give other people a chance to win. So <laughs> get, get ready to answer. Um, as Satya likes to say, that's not his rule, it's my rule. That, that, uh, that's his rule. <laughs> I, I'm very capitalist, I'm, uh, winner I'm, takes I'm, all. I'm a, I'm a mean old man, I'm a mean old, <laughs> mean old anarchist. Um, so, <laughs> so during the uh, presentation here, we talked a lot about web technology, specifically how JavaScript is used. What did we describe as the most used JavaScript library for this sort of work? Oh, are you, you guys are close. You're close. <laughs> this is a good one. I, I need to ask more JavaScript questions. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> OpenCV does have a JavaScript version. We, we shout, out out to the, shout out to uh, the Node for JS, uh, 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 OpenCV for Node people, by the way. Mm. Um, yeah, none of these, we're, we're, you're, you all are close. I'll give, you, I'll give you a hint, it starts with an A. Adam, thank you. Adam <laughs> correctly answered A-frame. We, we mentioned that one the most and first. Um, Adam, please send one email to phil at opencv.org. And we will, uh, with, if you want a t-shirt or active replica subscription, up to you. Uh, let me know and we'll make sure it happens for you. We've got a bunch of, bunch of questions from the audience here. Let's, uh, let's go to some audience questions, shall we? Uh, Steve Simpson, a brief note, would like to know, are you presenting at the VRTO event in July, Jacob? And not myself, but one of our um, close collaborators, uh, Ari Tar, who's a uh, virtual performer. I might actually plug a, a show that he has coming up um, here in a few minutes. Um, he does a lot of work on uh, virtual embodiment and how we can have avatars that help reflect the like humanness of us. And he's currently doing a workshop on um, how we can use um, Japanese tea ceremony or to calm our limbic systems when we're in uh, in virtual worlds. He's yeah. going to be at uh, VRTO uh, and kind of representing uh, Active Replica uh, while he's there, so. That's very interesting. Yeah, shout out to Toronto. I, I lived there for several years, as many people uh, here know. One of my one of my favorite cities. I, I need to visit one of these days again. Um, uh, quick, is uh, it, would, it, would it be okay if I just post a link to the uh, event? It's gonna be hosted on Active Replica um, that Aritar will be hosting. You can post whatever the hell links you oh, want. Oh, right. Cool. Here, so just for the for the person who's going to VRTO, uh, feel free to drop by this uh, this immersive performance um, next week uh, if you want, and uh, he'll be presenting at a VRTO. So, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, we'll we'll add this to the show notes as well. Uh, a question for me is. Has have you seen anybody integrating uh, cooperative? or competitive video games into these Mozilla hubs or other virtual event spaces in a really compelling way? Uh, yes to the first part of your question, no to the second part of your question. <laughs> um, there, there, so there are some folk, for example, you know, like uh, Frame VR, for example, recently launched a little uh, basketball simulator. You can pick one up and shoot it and make hoops and have, have the score ding over and it's cool. Uh, I know the uh, Immerse Space also have a fully playable gigantic chess set where you can you can sit there with another person and kind of like play chess. 
uh, I really do think that uh, gamification is one of the things that can be immersive web is uh, weak on right now and has a lot of opportunity when you start adding more gamification elements into it to be uh, much more engaging. Um, what we're finding right now is that there's the, the way to do it, though, is it's um, not that it's tricky, right? But what we end up doing often is um, playing with people the same way that we would in a real world scenario, right? Mm -hmm. So we often have a host, for example, we do a quiz night where um, where there's a host, we bring an audience of attendees, uh, break them into teams, everybody puts on a different avatar, the host asks questions, mocks the participants, spawns in 3D models, things like that, but it's human led and not kind of like a pro programmatic, uh, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so what we found is that um, the same sort of things that you might do at a pub night, a quiz night or something like that, are the types of things that are really uh, compelling uh, at this stage. Yeah, that makes sense. I, and you know my uh, kind of history with this, going back to what we discussed uh, toward the beginning of the webinar, with the bridge headset that we worked on at Occipital, when we both worked at Occipital, the uh, first, I think I made the first technically complete game for the for that headset, um, I believe it. which was a, the basketball a basketball game. You could, um, mm -hmm. it was just two two models, a hoop and a ball, and you could, do a quick 3D scan of your space with the structure sensor on an iPad, and then put a backboard wherever you wanted, and then you know grab a ball with the controller and just shoot hoops. It would you know bounce and land on the floor, and you know uh, the, the arc you released it at actually mattered and stuff like that. And it was really compelling. That's that's what made you're uh, mentioning that that other project made me think of this. I I got to check that out and it was really cool. There's also an aspect of this, and I think this is crucial that it's the kind of thing you can do while you're having a conversation. You can have, you know, like like basketball, like just shooting hoops, playing horse, right? You don't have to be playing one-on-one. -on -one. You might just be shooting hoops or having a catch or, you know, and then just having a conversation with your friends. And and that, uh, again, I've used this phrase earlier, is it's irreplaceable. It's you can't replicate mm -hmm. it uh, any other way. You have to be, you know, doing something and talking and to be able to do that, there has to be mechanics for that. And you can even make them up yourself. We, we kind of did this in one of your uh, active replica things. I recall we were just throwing a ball around at one point. And that, was, <laughs> that was that was really fun. Now, this goes actually back to Ari Tar's uh, workshop that he's going to be hosting that I posted the link to. And one of his core theses that he uh, explored at the University of uh, New York, NYU, New York University, mm -hmm. um, is that essentially socially, there's almost no situations in where you are sitting six inches from somebody's face, looking directly at each other, <laughs> unless you're in a very intimate moment or you're about to start fighting. And so, um, and so basically if you're or, one on or one, first on one call, then the other, uh, <laughs> there you go, either way. Um, but, uh, but, and so there's, there's parts of our brain that are kind of like, that's part of the zoom fatigue, right? But we're not sure how to react when we're staring directly into somebody's face in such close proximity. And that's why having having something to be doing, or again through these virtual worlds, being able to walk down a hallway and have a conversation, um, treats our nervous system better than I think a lot of the video conferencing based uh, approaches that we take currently. Yeah, just like going for a walk with somebody where you're standing side by side, you're not like looking at each other. <laughs> like, I mean, that's how that's how I walk down the street. <laughs> that, that, why do you think I haven't invited you over? <laughs> Um, but I, I, that's, yeah, that, that, you know, not to use a, a too much of a $5 word, but the, the verisimilitude, uh, it's, it's, uh, your, your body cares about that stuff in ways you don't necessarily know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, another question from the audience here, Steve would like to know, have you seen anybody, uh, integrating say, uh, a commodity, really affordable, powerful, a smart AI camera, like say OKD? into Mozilla hubs or these other, uh, how, are, how are folks doing these motion captures aside from just using their headset and maybe some some tracked controllers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are the full body mocap suits, like the film level ones. Mm -hmm. There are the depth cam based uh, systems that like uh, Valencia James used. Again, I believe they were using an Azure Connect um, because mm -hmm. their project uh, was launched, I believe in early 2019, so a little bit older. And then I do know that, again, there's that like pose reconstruction of like full bot, full avatar puppeteering from uh, from cameras. 
I don't know what cameras those are, um, those projects specifically are using, but there is definitely an intersection point between like the computer vision hardware and these uh, and these virtual worlds that I think we're only going to see more and more uh, exploration of as the years progress. Yeah, I could I could see Oak D, especially an Oak D Life, being really beneficial here because it's it's not going to slow your computer down for one. Um, if you're if you've got a low like some lower even some lower end hardware. You can join a act an active replica room uh, even on like a lower end phone. We've we've seen people you know uh, like a track phone kind of level tech and they're fine. But if you want to have those higher fidelity experiences where you know maybe eye tracking, maybe even just like chest up tracking, mm -hmm. uh, there's mm -hmm. there's awesome already extant uh, AI libraries and models to run that stuff you know lightning fast real time and just feed that JSON data over into your, your hub's world and mm -hmm, Bob's mm -hmm. your uncle. Yeah, um, no, I, I, think, I think we're going to see a lot more of that, uh, especially as we move into late 2022 and early 2023. And uh, shout out to our often sponsors at uh, Microsoft Azure. And, uh, <laughs> hi, hi, Sharon. Um, <laughs> we've, got, <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a couple. I, got, I have uh, another, another question here uh, from me, which is what is the thing that has surprised you most that you've seen other people doing this year with the industry you work in? Positive hmm. surprise. Not, <laughs> not... <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We don't have to talk about Mark Zuckerberg at all here. We can... <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that's really exciting for me and a, a bit surprising is how many niches are being filled through this uh through this kind of technology right i think it's easy to say like hey you know when all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail right but like again the virgils people out there building um these kind of like therapy sessions for autistic teens to connect with therapists like cool it's so great that there's plug and play technology where they didn't need to go and build the entire web stack in order to be able to do this um and, but because they had that web stack available they were able to find this really unique solution for it same thing with uh, folks out there building virtual classrooms. There are people doing uh, virtual theme parks and just the, the number of experiments that are able to be run because of kind of the like open sourced um, platforms that are being made available is um, not something that I, I would have uh, assumed, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, shout out another shout out from me to uh, uh, Antonia Forster, the LGBTQ plus VR museum. Uh, I just saw that uh, this week on it's on CNN or something is mm -hmm. extremely they, very, very cool project. Like, you know, get, kind of just, you know, gives you goosebumps, right? Like makes your, makes your face blush. You're like, wow, it's really, really uh, powerful. And, thing. and again, talking about the importance of like um, architecture and space, right? Again, you know, looking at some of the fly throughs up there, we can really see the amount of um, love that got put into that project and the sense of identity that that project has um, is really, really compelling. Yeah, I agree. Um, we're we're hitting up on you. Got any questions, Satya? You've been quiet over there. No, I'm I'm just absorbing because this is uh, this is new stuff uh, for me uh, too. I mean, I I know the headset based, um, you know, the research going on in the headset based and computer vision aspects of things, but this browser based uh, 3D worlds these are kind of new to uh, new to me. Uh, one thing that I it comes to mind is you know before this we had. Um, websites like Second Life, right? And uh, I mean, people said that th those were very, very popular. I don't know a single friend who was on Second Life, right? <clears throat> so quick, quick interjection, there was, do you remember when there was an AP or no, was it Reuters? I think Reuters had an embedded, like uh, War the, the comics writer Warren Ellis was covering Second Life for <laughs> Reuters at one time. Go ahead, Satya. Yeah, so that, I don't know whether it still exists, uh, whether it has fizzled out or not. Um, and, you know, is this the second wave of uh, that kind of technology? And where is it? Why do we think that it would be successful this time around? And many things happen like that, right? They are not successful yeah. the first time around. Uh, like, look at all the DoorDash kind of, uh, these kinds mm. of, uh, right? Mm -hmm. They were experimented they, in 1999. They had experimented with all of these um uh, you know, options where uh, people would get, um, you know, supplies for free Cheapo delivery, yeah, cheap delivery, etc. They all failed. But mm -hmm. now the same concept is coming back 
because things have changed, the technology has changed, the, uh, you know, maybe the supply chain has changed, whatever has changed quite substantially in, in 20 years, and now they become viable, uh, at least, you know. Not, uh, not to mention the venture capital landscape has changed mm -hmm. quite a bit yes. in 20 mm -hmm. years as well. Right. So uh, what do you think? I mean, uh, has something substantially changed? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, first of all, I think uh, things definitely have changed. Um, and I mean, even looking at uh, Second Life, right? Uh, so Second Life is still around and still does, I believe, has, uh, and I don't quote me on this, but I think their monthly recurring revenue is still in the millions, right? Like they're, they're, they're still a, like actual, not necessarily a powerhouse, but they're like uh, economically viable and like self-sustaining in a way that a lot of current other companies right now aren't. Um, but again, I mean, if you roll back 20 years, like um, you didn't have things like uh, uh, VoIP integrated directly into these uh, these experiences, right? You didn't have right. the proliferation of like headsets that we're seeing right now. One of right. the things about these virtual worlds right now is the fact that they're accessible through desktop is fantastic, right? But as we see more adoption of headsets and more need for this kind of like uh, easily accessible virtual worlds, that's just going to power the the uh, um, kind of add more fuel to the uh, the need for these virtual uh, ecosystems. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I don't think we can know for sure until, you know, we look back 10 or 20 years from now to know whether this is um, another little wave before the like big wave or whether it is the big wave, right? Um, but I think this is a really exciting opportunity to be experimenting with this technology. And if it's, it, if it is the time for this technology to really hit mainstream adoption, it'll happen. And if it's not, then we'll have learned a lot uh, in the process. So, right. Right. Well, shout out to my San Francisco neighbors, Linden Labs. Mm. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right. So I think uh, we are at the end of uh, this webinar now. Yeah. And thank you so much, uh, Jacob, for entertaining us and also telling us, uh, educating us a lot about uh, these this new emerging technology. I sure want to go and explore more uh, of what's what's out there. And thanks, Phil, for uh, putting this all together. And thank you all, our fabulous, fabulous uh, audience, for being here. And we'll see you next next week. Yeah, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks. Next week, our guest will be another awesome OpenCV Spatial AI Contest team, Team Robotic Element uh, Elephant. Chris will be joining us to talk about another really cool project from that uh, contest sponsored by Microsoft Azure and Intel. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. This week's episode was brought to you by OpenCV Courses. Learn computer vision and AI from the best at opencv.org slash courses. If you'd like to be in the audience next week, subscribe to the OpenCV newsletter.